All right, I am Lisa Wakefield. This is my husband, Joel, and we are here to present to you today. And the format today will be, I'm gonna teach and you're gonna work. We're gonna teach and you're gonna work. We're gonna teach and you're gonna work. Because I know as a classroom teacher, the only way I get better is if I actually have time to practice what I learn and that they give me time. Because I know when you get back to school, you're really, really busy and you don't always have time. The ideas are here and then you go to work and you're like, oh, I don't have time. So today we're going to give you time to apply what we teach you, okay? So I, I'm so glad you're happy about that. <laughs> A little bit about me, um, I teach in the high school, so secondaria in the United States. And I teach in Arizona. Um, Arizona has a lot of immigrants. So my classroom is filled with students from many countries. So I have students from Africa. I have students from Iraq. I have students from Syria. I have students from Mexico. I have students from Guatemala, Honduras, um, Cuba. Yeah. So that is what my classroom looks like. And it's very difficult at times. Um, I teach the very beginning level, students brand new to the country with no English. And then I teach the intermediate level, so they've maybe been here two years and have more English. And the ones that just walk into the country with no English, oh my gosh, it's so hard when we start school. So, all right. So I thought if you weren't happy to be here, I'd put a picture of my grandchildren because that will make you smile, right? I know everyone loves babies. And if you had a rough morning and you come in and you see babies, you go, oh, and then you're happy. So we are new grandparents. And these are our twin granddaughters that were born six months ago, Sage and Emery. So we are enjoying having them and spending time with them. We're looking forward to going back and seeing them. All right, so today, this first presentation is called Reaching All Your Students by Differentiating Your Instruction. All right? So our goals today are that you can explain differentiation that you can state the three parts of a lesson to differentiate, and then by the end of the day, we want you to create a lesson plan on a topic you pick, and it's going to have differentiation, it's going to have student-centered learning, and it's going to end with a task. Your assessment will be a task. All right, any questions on that? No. So I want you to think about your classroom and if you're not currently teaching, maybe a classroom you've been in. And what challenges, or these are challenges we have in our classroom. So put a student's name to each of those challenges. For example, requires more time. In my class, that is Sarah. She's very slow with her learning, and she takes a lot more time than any other student to do a project. So go through and read those and think of your students. about Saren. Jose brings a lot of knowledge with him. He doesn't like to share that knowledge and he doesn't like you to know he has all that knowledge, but Jose is the one who brings a lot of knowledge that other students don't. Need to move around? That's Aaron. Oh my gosh, when I do an activity where Aaron can move, he's just in his element. <laughs> he just can't sit. Seems to have given up on school. This was a boy I had last year named Hector. He didn't want to be at school. He came every single day, but he didn't want to work. He didn't care. He just was there. Has 
difficulty concentrating. Oh, I have this boy, Kaparo. As I'm doing a whole group lesson and I'm trying to teach, Kaparo is looking somewhere else and I have no idea where he is and I have to kind of go over and try and refocus him. For test takers, I have this girl, Gertrude. She's the most hardworking student. I just love her because she works so hard. She gives it 110% and then she takes the test and she doesn't do great. And yet she's worked so hard and my heart just kind of breaks for her because I know she did, gives me her best. And will not engage with learning. This was Ruben. If it wasn't meaningful to him, he didn't really want to do it. So the point of this is our class is made up of all kinds of students. They're all different, they learn differently, and that's kind of the, the cool thing about being a teacher is we just have this, this different group of people in our class. So I want you to get up in a minute and move around, and I, what I want you to do is I want you to put your hand up, and then look for someone else with their hand up, tap hands with that person, and then say what you think differentiation means, what it means to you, what is differentiated instruction. Just quick, not a five minute answer, but just a quick answer of what you think differentiation is. Each of you share. When you're done, put your hand back up. Walk around, find someone else with their hand up. Slap hands, Joel, you wanna stand up? And then share with each other. So we're walking, ah, oh, there's someone. And then I tell him what I think, he repeats, and we move around again. Because you know, if you just sit here, it's gonna be boring today. All right, so everybody get up, put your hand up, and find a partner. And Say what you think differentiation is. You gotta move, you gotta move. Put your hand up, slap hands with someone. <laughs> Thank you. 
respond to them in our teaching. Carol Tomlinson talks about the ability to differentiate in three areas, content, process, and product. For content, student choice is one way we might differentiate, like allowing students to choose their research topics or essay prompts. As teachers, we need to keep our eyes on the prize. In other words, we have to keep asking ourselves, what are the main learning objectives? One day, my students were writing an argument essay about what would be the worst natural disaster to experience. John's head was down the desk. He was not doing anything. I knew that he was interested in football, so I told him that he could write an essay on why his favorite team was the best. He would still have to make an argument just about football instead of hurricanes or earthquakes. His eyes lit up. He got to work and wrote what his mother later told me was the first essay he had ever written in school. He had followed all the guidelines of a good argument essay. The prize, in this case, was learning to write an argument essay, not learning to write about natural disasters. To differentiate by process, teachers can change up how they group students. Sometimes a mixed ability group might work best while sometimes it might be appropriate to have same ability groups. We might have an English proficient buddy work with an English language learner to help him out. During independent reading time in my early morning class several years ago, one student tended to fall asleep. I told him that if he wanted, he could go to the back and sit at the desk and read. Soon, several others joined him. A few days later, I saw another student dozing off. Before I could say anything, one of his classmates whispered to him, Just go sit on the desk. Again, it's a matter of keeping our eyes on the prize. What are the learning objectives and what are the best roads to get there for different students? Teachers can also differentiate by the type of product that students create. The major demonstration of learning doesn't always have to be an essay or a multiple choice test. One year I had a student who liked to doodle when other students or I were talking. I told her it was okay as long as she was doodling about the information we were discussing. She built on those doodles to create a final project that brilliantly and visually represented all the key points we had covered. When I give tests, I often give students an extra blank page where they can write anything else they remember about the topic being tested that they think is important. I often find the quality of thinking and writing better there than in response to my test questions. None of the differentiating strategies I've mentioned have created any extra work for me. They did require that I had relationships with my students to know their strengths, challenges, and interests. And I needed to demonstrate flexibility in my thinking. Making these strategies successful also required building a strong class culture so that some of the students were being treated differently and they understood why. And they understood that, that was the only way to be truly fair. The ideas mentioned here are just a drop in the bucket. There are a zillion other ways we can support our students' gifts and challenges. We just need to keep our minds and ears open. I love that video because I think it gives a very simple definition of differentiation. And I think we can relate to that video and understand it. I forgot to tell you earlier, in your um, bags are note takers for today so that you can write notes on these. So go ahead and open your folders yeah, in your bags. I should put them. I'm very fast. Different. You have my same presentation. It's in here. There you go. So look for the one that says differentiating instruction. It's green. Yes, perfect. So you have this. If you want to take it out and use it, you can follow right along on the handout. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry about that. My favorite saying in this video is fair is not equal. Did you catch that? Yes. Fair is not equal. I showed you a picture of my twin granddaughters up there. I guarantee you they will learn differently. Even though they're twins, they'll learn differently. And I think a great example of fair not being equal is Joel and I do CrossFit. Do you know what CrossFit is? Okay, so we do CrossFit because uh, we just like to exercise and it keeps us healthy and in shape. And so fair is not equal in CrossFit. I go, my daughter goes 
goes to CrossFit. She's 27 years old. I'm much older. So um, she's lifting more weights than I am. And sometimes I look and I go, oh, how come she's so much stronger? And then I have to remind myself that I'm not 27 anymore. But you know what? At the end of the workout, I'm exhausted. She's exhausted. I've gotten a good workout. She's gotten a good workout. I'm healthy. She's healthy. We're not working out with the same weights, but we're getting the same outcome at the end. So keep that in mind. Fair is not always equal. So what is differentiation? So here's the real definition. It's a teacher's response to learners' needs. And you guys talked about that as you walked around. It means to give students an opportunity to work at their level. Some students need more support than other students. It's the recognition of students' varying background knowledge and preferences. In my classroom, there's so much differentiation going on in students' background knowledge. Some have been in refugee camps. Some have missed two or three years of schooling because of war in their countries. So it's, it's very different, and I need to know that some don't have that knowledge that others do. So one thing um, I do sometimes to work on their preferences is I give them choice. Um, I have to teach grammar. So one of my classes I teach is grammar. And one day I was thinking, well, what can I do to differentiate this lesson a little bit and give students some choice? So I made little cards. Some of the words on there were nouns, and some were not nouns. So there were cards. And then I had this paper that said noun walk around. So students could go to the library, they could go to the office, they could go to the cafeteria, and they could look for words that were nouns and make a list of them. And then I use Google Classroom. So in my Google Classroom, I had activities on the computer to practice doing nouns and finding nouns and some games. And I had taught nouns the day before. So I just said, okay, we're gonna practice with nouns today. Do you wanna go walk? Do you want to use the cards, or do you want to get on the computer? Your choice. And then it appeals to students' preferences or their backgrounds. And so some students wanted to go walk around campus, about four. About three or four wanted to do the cards, and everyone else wanted to get on the computer. Because my students love doing grammar games on the computer. So that was the way I used differentiation. And then it's instruction that appeals to students' differences. Um, I loved the video where the man let the boy write about football. The kid did not want to write an essay. Who wants to write an essay? You know, and then he told the student, how about you write about football? And all of a sudden, he was excited. And he wrote his first argument essay. He was doing something he didn't want to do because the teacher uh, tuned into his differences and what would motivate him. So I put up this visual for you. Teachers can differentiate three parts of the lesson, and they talked about that in the video. The content, the process, and the product. And we're going to work through each of those pieces today and talk about them. And then you differentiate those pieces according to students' readiness, interest, and the learning profile. So those are the components we're going to look at a little more in detail as we go through this presentation. So the three elements you can differentiate are the content, process, and the product. The content is what you teach, that direct instruction you give students, the information they need to know for the topic or lesson you're creating. It, it's referred to sometimes as the I do. As a teacher, you're doing it. You're giving students the model. You're giving students the information. So that is what content means. The process is what the students do. Sometimes we call it the we do. So students are practicing with the information you gave them, and you're there to help them. So it's the activities in which the students engages to make sense and learn that information. And then there's the product. This is the culmination of the lesson. This is how you figure out, did the student understand the information I taught? Can they apply what they learn to something? Sometimes that's a test. For us today, we're going to do a task-based 
product. You're going to create a task the students will do to prove they learned the information. So the three ways are the content, which is the I do, the teacher teaches, the process, which is the we do, we help the students and they do it, and then the product is the you do. So today you're going to do the product of the you do, the student does it. Questions on those parts? Clear? Okay. So differentiating the content, how do we do this? What are some ways we can do that in our classroom? We can use reading materials at different reading levels. I put up here a website for you. It's called newzella.com, if you want to write that down. And in that website, you can pick topics for reading, and you can adjust the reading level. So you can do a lower one, a medium one, a higher one. It's done by Lexile. So one might be a 500 level Lexile, an 800, a 900. They're all the same topic, they're just different reading abilities. So might be a great resource for your classroom if you teach reading or do some reading activities to make some a little easier than others. Um, I'm fortunate in my class, uh, we have a reading program we use. So at the beginning of the year, my students take a test and then I have all different levels of books. So every student is reading a different book at different levels and throughout the year they're still working on main idea and details, comparing contrasting, sequencing, cause effect, but at different levels. All right. So when we're differentiating the content, we may want to differentiate the reading material. Putting text on tape, giving students something that's an auditory piece for them. They could listen to it if they're not great at reading. Using spelling or vocabulary list based on the student's readiness. Remember, fair is not equal. So if you have a student who really struggles, maybe they only get 10 vocabulary words or 10 spelling words and everyone else gets 15 or 20. And that student is gonna work just as hard on those 10 as the other student who works on the 20. So it's changing that up based on students' needs. Presenting information through visual and auditory means. Did you notice the visual I gave you today? What was the visual I gave you today? The video, yes. I don't know your learning styles. I don't know your English ability. I don't know how you prefer to learn. So I have differentiated the content of this presentation, hopefully for everyone to get something out of it. So I showed the video. I don't know about you, but my students love a video. If I'm teaching a grammar component and if I'm doing something on verbs or nouns or adjectives or adverbs, I always put a little video clip in, and my students are like this. I mean, they're just so engaged. And especially if I can find a grammar video with music, then they're just singing along, and we did one, a verb is a verb is a verb is a verb. You can do it, you can do it, you can do it, it's a verb. And you know, where the whole class was just singing the song by the end. Because videos grab students' attention. I also put in the graphic organizer. So for those of you that are like me, that are visual learners, I had a chart so you could see each piece and you might go, ah, okay, I see what we're doing here. So I've differentiated the content of this presentation a little bit. All right, manipulatives, something that's hands-on. Um, I like to have my students make foldables. And at the end of the day, we're gonna do a quick presentation on foldables, and it's manipulative. When I had the nouns, um, I used the nouns more in the process part, but they were cars that they could manipulate. And then last, meeting with small groups to reteach ideas or skills, or meeting with those really high groups to challenge them a little bit more. I tend to have to meet with small groups of students who are struggling. I tend to put my class into groups then that way they can kind of work and help each other and then I can sit with the students who are really struggling and I kind of focus them and then I move around and help everyone else. All right, so this is ways to differentiate the content, which is the I do as the teacher and it's that information you give students. You have a lesson plan in your um, packet. Why don't you 
go ahead and take out your lesson plan and we can just kind of look at that. Yes. So if you look at this and you want to take out your highlighter or anything, this first page is all the content. This is the content piece of the lesson plan. If you want to write the content or the I do, whatever to help you remember. So this is where I as the teacher, I'm modeling and I'm giving direct instruction and I'm teaching students. So this is my content, all right? All right, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. I just wanted you to see it visually because we're going to move on to the next part. The next part is the process piece of the lesson plan. And what are ways we can differentiate the process? And this is what you do, or we do, sorry. The students are doing it. One way is using tiered activities. All learners working with the same concept or the same understanding, but at different levels. So I'm going to show you an example of a tiered activity I do in my classroom. This is a game I made. We had just learned comparative and superlative adjectives and adverbs. So I made this game where students could sit in partners and play. And I gave them some little notes. I scaffolded it right down here. I said if it's a comparative, that's going to be two items, and here's what you're going to use. If there's three items in the box, like here, it's the superlative, and this is what you're going to use. Mm -hmm. So that was for my average student, my student who pretty much understood the lesson and was able to play the game, and this was a way for them to practice speaking and using and applying the comparative to the superlatives. Now, I had students last year who really, really struggled. They couldn't do this. So I changed it. It's the same objective, but this gives more help for my students who need it. I know my learners' readiness levels with English, and I differentiated by doing this. So if you can see here, I told them they're going to have to decide if it's best or better. Because good is a really hard one, and for my struggling learners, they'll say gooder. So I had to give them a little more help. Here, I just told them. You're going to use the EST, cutest. Here, I told them, it's going to be friendlier, the ER. Here, more popular. Here, safest. So I, and then here, I stopped telling them. I just gave them the most, because they're just going to add that, most boring. And this way, they're still able to do the activity. The goal is that they're speaking and using those comparatives and superlatives with each other, so they're rolling the dice and they're saying, ah, Mrs. Wakefield is the cutest. I put my name up there because it makes them laugh. <laughs> um, and I put other teachers' name up there because I think that's fun. So do you see the difference? I tiered the activity. And this wasn't a lot of extra work. It was just adding more support and differentiating the content, or the process, so when they're practicing, they had the extra help. The other way you can differentiate the process is using graphic organizers. And some of these you may want to fill in extra pieces. Sometimes I'm giving my students notes, and I just take out a few words in the notes, and they just have to fill in a little bit. This can also fall into content. Um, and then other students have to take all the notes. Again, they're all working the same. They're getting the same objective but I'm making it easier for those who need it made easier. Creating interest centers that encourage students to explore. Uh, in my reading class, we've been doing a unit on World War II, and my students have questions. Like, Mrs. Wakefield, what happened to the Germans? I don't know. That is a really great question. Mrs. Wakefield, how many people died? I don't know. So what I've done in my classroom is I put a poster like this, and it says parking lot, and then I have post-it notes, sticky notes. And when they have that question, I say, go write the question and put it on the board. And so they're putting questions they have up here. And then um, as we go into the next unit, they're going to do the same thing. And in December, when it's almost the end of the semester, 
I'm going to say, go find a question and figure out the answer and tell the class, report it back to the class. Again, it's something that they want to know about. And I don't know about your students, but when my students do something they want to know about, they are super, super excited about it. Um, last year, we were reading about amendments in the United States and the rights of people in the United States, and we read this article about this man who was in prison for murder. And he was going to be killed. He was on death, what we call death row. Mm -hmm. Well, he wasn't guilty. He didn't commit the crime. So finally, after 10 years or so, they had extra evidence, new DNA testing, and he was proven innocent. So it made me think, and I just asked my class, I said, do you, do you want to know more about the death penalty? And they went, yeah. We would love to know more about the death penalty. And I said, okay, I'm going to put together a task that you can do at the end of the unit, and you can learn more about the death penalty. You would like that? And they went, uh-huh. So when we finished that unit, I basically gave them a framework. And I said, your job is to decide if you think, if you agree with the death penalty or you disagree with the death penalty. And you have to have a claim, your statement, because that was part of our class goal. And you have to give me evidence from research. And then you have to present that to the class. Oh my God. It was one of the best learning times in my classroom because they wanted to do it and they worked really, really hard. And they would be yelling across the room at me, Miss Wakefield, come and watch this. Do you know how much it costs to do da 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 da? And I'm like, Well, no, I don't know that. Well, look here, watch this video. And they're watching videos and they're researching and they're excited and they're energetic and they did a great job. So when we can create some interest and have that flexibility and open our minds to let students learn some things they're interested in. We're really going to see the energy and excitement of learning. Create sentence frames. Do you guys know what I mean when I say sentence frames? Okay, um, let me find a marker. We have a marker back there that's open. We have, we have some in here. I just don't, I think they're all in the back of the room. So, I, especially with my students, I have to do a lot with sentence frames. So they, um, maybe they'll be writing something, uh, I'm teaching them, I am so-and-so. So I might put the sentence frame, I am, and then they know what to do, or is, and sometimes I write the whole phrase up there. You know, so if I'm wanting them to walk around and they have to ask each other questions, is it singular or, and then they just fill in plural. So sentence frames are like you start the sentence for them and then they continue filling it in. So I, especially when I want my students to speak, they don't always know how to construct that sentence and what to say. So if I give them the sentence frame, it helps them. Providing manipulatives or hands-on material, and then varying the length of time to complete a task, or adjusting the task. Sometimes I'll walk around to a student and I will say, okay, just give me three sentences. I've assigned the class five sentences. I've said, okay, everyone write five sentences about whatever, and then I walk over and I go, You can just see the relief of that student going, okay. I only have to do three. And again, fair is not equal. It's just as time consuming and just as challenging for that student to write three as it is for you to write five. Or I might be doing a paragraph and I require three supports and I might tell the student, okay, I just need two from you. And that's okay because the goal is they're writing and they're attempting. And as the year goes on, they might be able to give me three later, but right now all they can do is this. So we want to differentiate that process of our students' learning and change it up as needed. Okay, so this part of your lesson plan, if you look on the, I don't know how yours are copied, is it front to back? Okay, so this part of your lesson plan 
is actually going to be the guided practice. So this is the process or the we do. So you might write near the guided practice process. So this, the next page, this is the process part of your lesson plan. So this would be the process part. Okay. And that's the we do. The students do it and you're there to help them and support them in doing it. Esta bueno? Esta bien? Which yeah. is correct. Esta bien or esta bueno? Esta bien. Esta bien? Yes. Entiendo? Yes. I need to speak much faster if I'm in Chile. This is Spanish. Yeah. I spent almost a year in Peru and I felt pretty good. I was learning survival Spanish. And then I come here and I'm just like, whoa, whoa. You people speak so fast. I can't do it. Yeah, no, I mean, just 
like I told them, I also have competitive students too. Mm -hmm. So they also are very worried about those differences, you know. Yeah. But I mean, they understand, but still they question your decisions yes. in the classroom yeah. sometimes. Yeah. All the time, but mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle with those students? Um, I think mine is a unique situation in the sense that they're all struggling. Right. Um, and I teach the lower levels, that I, they don't give me a lot of what we call an English flack about it. They may question it a little bit, and some of them will be like, well, that's not fair. And I just go, well, you know, it's not fair. Yeah, yeah. And I, I tell them, I say, life's not fair. Right. You're going to find out in the real world that life is not always fair. <laughs> Things are always not done your way. And I kind of just put the kibosh on it. Right. Um, you know. So it'll, it'll be that culture I think you have to kind of create in your classroom. And like I said, I'm very subtle about it. Um, when I go up and say, I'm just kind of like, just read two sentences. I'm pretty quiet in the way I do it. Or I'll go and I'll cross out. Like I might cross out three questions just to reduce the amount of work for them because I know they won't finish it. Right. Yeah. And I will. I'll have students say, well, well how come he only? You know, don't worry about it. Just do your work. <laughs> you know, I'm the teacher, you're the student. So sometimes you just have to be real. So, but those are excellent questions. It's, it's things you'll have to wrestle with. I'm trying to see if I had another note in here. Uh, down, no, that's a different page. Sorry about that. Um, oh, I want to show you this. Last year I was reading some research and it was about how in the 21st century, students need, I took some of these slides out to make it not so many, how in the 21st century, students need collaboration skills, they need problem solving skills, they need communication skills, and it talked about how we don't work in a silo, that we work together, that's the kind of learning we do. And I, I don't know, I was, as I was reading that, I was like, hmm, I'm going to try something different in my class. So my students have these exams they have to take, and they're very difficult. Um, and they go with each of our units that are part of our reading program. So I came in and decided that I was going to have the students take an exam with a partner. Now, it's a reading test, so they each had to read the reading passage individually. And then they had to discuss what they thought the correct answers were for that reading passage and come to agreement to the best they could. And then when they were done, they had to put their own answers in. <coughs> so the test is actually done on the computer. That's why the computers are out. So it was like, you each have to put in your own answer. You each have to read. But I want you to discuss the questions and figure out the answers together. My goal, again, thinking about differentiation, my goal was that they do well on the test, but that they're speaking, they're collaborating, and they're doing some higher level thinking, and they're problem solving. Because what I find is some of my students are lazy. And if I give them a reading test that's pretty long, some of them will kind of shh, and then they'll get the answers and they'll just guess. And they won't give me 100%. But when I did this, they were forced to collaborate and talk. And you should have seen them actually talking about what they read and about what the answer could be. And I had kids going, well, no, but look, right here it says this. I, and you know, they're, and I was like, oh, this is beautiful. Yes. They're thinking, <laughs> they're talking, they're working. They're not just giving me 70% effort. And it was the coolest thing. So I'm continuing it this year. And my students think it's pretty cool. Like we just took our second test and they said, do we get to do it with partners? And I said, do you want to do it with partners? And they went, yeah. And I said, in my class, we're doing it with partners. Maybe in other classes you don't do this. But in my class, I think you work harder. So yeah, we're doing it with partners. Again, it's that ability to be flexible and think what is best for your students' learning. And that eyes on the prize, meeting the outcome. So this is something, I mean, I've been teaching 30 years. And I just kind of implemented this last year based on something I read. And it's really different, but I love it. So, all right. So we've talked about three things you differentiate. What are they? The content, 
content, the process, the product. Yes. Now, I want you to understand you don't have to differentiate every piece of that in your lesson plan. Okay? You don't have to specifically go, okay, how am I going to differentiate the content? How am I going to differentiate the process? How am I going to differentiate the product? For today's purposes, we're going to practice it, but it doesn't have to be done every day that way. All right? Uh, most of the time, because my students all struggle, I do pretty direct instruction, and I don't differentiate the content a lot, but I do differentiate the process. That's really where most of my differentiation comes in in the classroom, and sometimes the product. Yes? I have some doubts related to the rubrics. Uh, I don't understand how to do it. Like, uh, indeed, yes, I use rubrics a lot, uh, but I never thought of differentiating rubrics, you know, because I try to um, do rubrics that are more general, okay. and then they can be approachable to most students. So can you go deeper on that? Yeah, so um, I use rubric, like, so the, the, the thing we did on the death penalty, my rubric was that you had a claim, you had three pieces of evidence, and you had your response, and that you had, I think, two sources for your research. So that, my rubric kind of said, you know, um, content, had this piece, um, grammar and spelling. I, I'm trying to remember exactly what the rubric looked like. So I could differentiate that by saying you only need one source. Oh, okay. Maybe that student is not great at research and they could only find one source to support their evidence. Okay. So that would be, maybe everyone else had to have three, but maybe I'd let this lower student just have one source. Right. Um, go ahead, Joel. Or you provide a source so they have to, you give them one and they find one. Yeah, that would be a great way. Yeah. Nice. So, um, you know, on that student too, I might say that maybe they didn't have to have as much evidence to support their answer. So, and I don't always hand them a different rubric, I kind of do that verbally. Mm -hmm. So I, to make my life easy, mm -hmm. I make one rubric, yep. and then I will walk over to that kid and kind of cross out a couple things. Mm -hmm. You know, give me one source. Right. Yeah. Does that help, does that answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was um, more difficult, but. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's not. Yes, yeah. do you have another idea? No, that's not. we'll add rubrics up there. To that's going to be two items. We have another here's what you're going to use. Okay, so if there's three, three items on uh, your lesson right plan, here, the task is, is the content. If you want to, or I'm sorry, the products. Mm -hmm. If on your lesson so plan you want to take that last stage where it says pretty much independent practice, mm -hmm. that would be your product part of the lesson plan. And I got a little carried away on the product part on my sample lesson plan. I was having way too much fun. <laughs> so I just threw out tons. All right, so we differentiate the content, the process, and the product. And there's ways we can do that. So these are, if you're visual, these are doors that kids come through. So we differentiate it based on students' readiness level. That means, what is the student's prior knowledge? What do they already understand? How ready are they to learn this topic? So for you guys, maybe they have some English and they're, they have a little bit of that English already, so they're ready to go on to the next level. Maybe they don't know any English and they're not really ready. So for me, some of my students knew what nouns were and then some have no clue what a noun is. So their readiness level is completely different. So that tells me how much scaffolding I need to do, how much direct instruction I need to do, and if there's gaps and how I fill in those gaps. We can also do this by their interest level. What engages your students? What gets them curious? Um, what will make them want to know more? Um, my reading going on about World War II, I never thought my students would be excited about this. But again, I've pulled in some videos on the war. The articles we have are interesting, and they're just getting curious, and they're wanting to know more. 
Um, so I know videos work for my students. The same in my grammar class. When I can throw in some grammar games or I can pull in some videos, it gets them more interested. So you have to figure out your students. What is their interest level? What motivates them? Can you create a WhatsApp group and throw in some video links or some video games that tie into your lesson for them to play? And then their learning profiles. Um, how do they best learn? You know, are they visual learners? Are they auditory learners? Are they kinesthetic? Are they tactile? Um, do they have musical intelligence? Do they have artistic intelligence? Um, how about gender roles? You know, I have a lot of kids from Muslim countries. Is it better to put two girls together? Is it better to do boy-girl? What's their learning style? What's their learning profile? How can you best help them? So this will influence how you differentiate your instruction based on your students' interest, readiness, and learning profiles. All right, we're going to need to move on to our lesson plan in a few minutes here, but I want to check for your understanding and make sure you understand what we're doing, because that's what good teachers do. They check to <laughs> make sure you're getting it. So with your table groups, first of all, turn and talk. What are you already doing in your class to differentiate instruction? And then what are the three parts of the lesson to differentiate? So go ahead and take about two or three minutes and talk to your table groups.
If you're at Joel's table, just fold your paper in half and then fold it again. I have it, Joel. And make your name 10. And there's some markers. Go ahead and put your name on there so that we can learn everybody's names. Okay, we're going to move into the application part now. I've talked long enough. So we're going to break up into groups based on what you teach. Oh, I'll, I'll give you a minute to make your name tense. <laughs> Enjoy the American candy. I know it's not as good as the Valdivia chocolate, no. but it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> we found the chocolate store yesterday. Oh. <gasps> oh my gosh. I walked in, I didn't even know where to begin. <laughs> it was looked amazing. You have to take some. Yes, I had to take, um, I bought some alfa yes. with manahar, um, naranja, y maybe masapai, a, a variety pack to take home for friends and family. So I think I need to go get some um, manahar. Where's the best place to buy manahar? Supermarket, supermarket. Yeah, you have to buy the... Yes. <laughs> the what? Mm -hmm. Kulun. 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 That's it's the brand. It's a brand. And how do you spell it? Kulun. C O L U N. Kulun. Yeah. And you can find it in the like supermarkets. Supermarkets. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the best. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's <laughs> muy importante. From this side. Yeah. <laughs> this side of the country. Yeah. It's from this side of the country. Yes. Okay. Oh, it's Horno. Yes. Okay. All right. You can make. You can finish your name tags in a minute because I want to give you time to work before the coffee break. So what we're going to do next? What we're going to do next is you're going to get, actually. You guys are probably going to get in groups of two or three, and you're going to select a card with the topic. All right. So select a topic you teach or that you're going to teach coming up, and you're going to create the content part of your lesson plan. So remember our goal today was that you would leave with a completed lesson plan. So as you do that, you're going to write the objectives, your set, and your information. You have a blank lesson plan template in your folder. Yours looks like this, except for it doesn't have the writing. So you have a blank one of these for the content, the process, and the product. So today, for this session, you're only going to do the top part. All right, so let's look at my model. Look at the one I've made. I picked the topic of what we eat. I'm the filled in one. I picked the topic of what we eat. And my objectives were that students would say the names of foods they eat in English. They would talk about what they eat either for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, assuming these are low-level beginners who don't know much English. And they would complete a task about foods. That will be my product at the very end. So in America, we always start with what we call a set to activate students' prior knowledge, to get them thinking about the topic. So in my lesson plan, I said, do you know the names of any foods in English? And they probably know pizza, French fries. So you know, get some, oh yeah, I know some. What are some foods you know? So I might have a partner and do a think, pair, share. Or I might have them do like I did with you, where they get up and say, oh, what they know in English to get them up and moving. All right, and then my information and model, what I'm going to put on the board for them is in America, well, I'm going to talk about this. Most Americans eat breakfast before school or work. They eat lunch at school or work, and they eat dinner after school or work. <coughs> and then I would show them. So breakfast is at 7 a.m., and these are typical foods we eat. Lunch is at noon, and these are typical foods we eat. 
Now, this is where I would probably differentiate the content a little bit by having visuals. Mm -hmm. So instead of just saying it, I would say and show. Mm -hmm. And I would have pictures of all those foods so they could see them. And then I would have them copy this, or I might even print this out and just have them put it in their notebook, depending on what you think is appropriate for your students. And again, this is the content piece. And then I would say, I would put on my board, what do you eat for breakfast? And then I would give them maybe the sentence frame, I eat. And if I really wanted to scaffold it more, I could say I eat blank. I could fill it in more for those students who really, really struggle. And so this is just my, this is the I do, this is my direct instruction, this is me teaching students about what we eat. Alright, so you're just going to do the objective, the set, and the information and model. So I want you to find a partner, try and go by grade level, like if you teach high school, go with a high school teacher. If you teach preschool, go with a preschool teacher. If you teach fifth grade, Go with a fifth grade teacher. And then these are topics from your curriculum. Mm -hmm. So you can come here and pick any one you want to do. You've got a blank lesson plan, and we're just going to work for about the next 30 minutes. Okay? Are you with us? Okay, go for it.